how we attached or did not attach to primary caregivers in our childhood has much to do with how we attach or fail to attach to romantic partners as adults. Because the same neural circuits, the neurons and their connections in the brain and body that underlie attachment between infant and caregiver, between toddler and parent or other caregiver, and during adolescence and in our teenage years are repurposed for adult romantic attachments. Okay, so we've got our four categories. We've got category one, which is securely attached. We've got category two, which is insecurely attached, also sometimes called anxious avoidant. Then we've got category three, which is the resistant insecure category, which is anxious ambivalent. And then there's this fourth category, the disorganized, disoriented category, or the so-called D babies. Now, what's interesting about this from the perspective of desire, love, and attachment is that the categorizations of children into one of these four different categories as toddlers is strongly predictive of their attachment style in romantic partnerships later in life, which is to me both amazing and surprising and not surprising all at the same time. Amazing because it means that, uh, first of all, we are relatively hardwired for attachment. I think that that's incredible and beautiful that we have designated neurons, nerve cells, and hormonal systems that are there to ensure that we have some sort of response to a caregiver being there or not being there or returning or leaving. When people say relationship is hard, the only really hard part about, of a good relationship is just dealing with oneself and making sure yeah. that you're staying in that mode of caretaking. Because I do believe that if one is mainly focused on taking good care of the other person, provided they're also focused on taking good care of you to some extent, and we're good at taking care of ourselves, everybody flourishes, everything gets better. There is a power dynamic in relationships. Sometimes, not all, but in some relationships, it works much better if one person leads and the other person follows. In other relationships, it's more mutuality, works best. People need to know what they need. And so knowing what you need and what you crave is really important. And then once you do that, you can create the relationship you want. I've seen that over and over again. And people are different. You have to be careful the questions you ask in a relationship too. You have to make sure you really want that information. And it's not just about people's past, right? If you ask somebody how they really feel about something about you and they tell you, that may be soothing. It may be intensely stressful. For a relationship to work, you have to be brave. You can't go in there fully protected. And yet you also can't go in there with no boundaries because you'll end up beat up. What's that quote? If you want to be a warrior, prepare to get hurt. If you want to be an explorer, prepare to get lost. And if you become a lover, prepare to be both. Love's scary because it takes us back to that primitive circuitry that is as primitive and basic as hunger, thirst, the desire for heat when we're cold, the desire for cold when we're overly uh, warm. The insula is a really interesting brain area that allows us to interocept, to pay attention to what's going on inside our body and to split some of our attention to exterocept. And the mating dance, whether or not it's um, the dinner and date portion of the mating dance, that is a coordinated activity of two bodies, typically it's two. That coordinated dance is one in which the autonomic nervous system of one individual in general is coordinating with the autonomic nervous system of the other individual and the insula is essentially splitting one's attention between how we feel ourselves, how our body feels, what we're thinking, with the thinking and the body's bodily sensations of the other. And that can be communicated obviously through words, it can be communicated through sounds, it can be communicated through touch, and it can be communicated through a number of, um, of kind of more subtle cues like pupil size or whether or not, um, certainly in cases where we recognize the person and we kind of know their responses, their autonomic responses under different conditions, we can assess, is the person comfortable? Are they uncomfortable? Are they, um, are they more focused on me or on themselves? This is the, the coordinated silent dance that if we look at in neurobiological terms, we can really see is all about the autonomic nervous system. Our nervous system is tethered to the nervous systems of others, and that is true from the very earliest stages of our lives. That is vitally important to understand because if one is successful in forming 
romantic attachments, maintaining them, etc. Or not, does in fact reflect the earlier templates that you've created. But as I've mentioned before, the good news is that these templates can shift over time. And one of the more powerful ways to shift those templates over time is purely by the knowledge that they exist and the understanding that those templates are malleable. They can change through the process of neuroplasticity. Ultimately, a relationship, however one structures it, is gonna be part of your daily routine. So at the point where you're like, you know, I'd really love to wake up next to somebody and do blank and blank together. And then I'd love to work and then we meet for dinner and then we, you know, take the dog for a walk or take kids out or whatever it happens to be, take a trip or do it. You have to be, one has to be in the mindset of wanting to do couple-like things. There's a certain brain area, it's called the ventromedial hypothalamus. And this is a brain area that's really interesting because it has a population of neurons that control mating, you stimulate them, and animals will just start trying to copulate with basically whatever's around. If you give them a choice of their usual preference of you know females if they're male, males if they're female, and we have switches, right? I mean, we have switches for rage, switches for all these things. I mean, that's like this idea that we have all things inside of us. I mean, people vary in their propensity for rage or for love or for anything, but at some level, we do have all things inside of us. We have the circuitry within us. Breakups, what's happened is the person is no longer available in time and space. This is why when someone breaks up, you literally have to let them go, right? You know, con constant pursuing of them is out of context, is not healthy. They have a name for that, it's called a stalker. Don't do it. Um, but it's almost as if you have to, the brain has to think that the person is gone in time and space. This has become much harder with social media, right? Because people can check up on people, they can hear from people. In the old days, like when I was growing up, you just like took the phone off the hook or you, you diverted your attention. Now we are constantly renewing that the person is still there. And so love and the loss of love and the death grief are virtually identical. It's that motivational state. And this is why it's so hard to not reach out to somebody that you really miss and want back.